This is video number six in a series looking at the physics topic of energy. In this video we'll look at elastic deformation and how we can use calculations to predict the elastic potential energy stored in a spring. By the end of this video you should know the difference between elastic and inelastic deformation, you should be able to define elastic potential energy, recall the equation to calculate elastic potential energy, calculate the energy stored in a spring using this equation, and then also rearrange that equation and use it to calculate spring constants and extension. When discussing elastic potential energy, we start by talking about deformation, which means changing the shape of an object. In order to change an object's shape, there must be more than one force acting on it. If there was just one force, then the object would move in response to the single force, so its shape wouldn't change. We can separate deformed objects into those that are elastic and those that are inelastic, or sometimes we call this plastic. Springs are elastic. This means that when a force acts on a spring, it will increase in length, which we call extension, but then when that force is removed, the spring will return to its original length. If an object is inelastic, then it may still extend, but it doesn't return to its original length when we remove the force. Springs aren't endlessly elastic. Every spring has a particular point that we call the limit of proportionality or the elastic limit, and if you stretch it past this point, it won't return to its original length. This is particularly important when you get to studying forces and Hooke's law, but it isn't so important for now. We just need to be aware that the formula we're going to use to calculate elastic potential energy is only valid before the limit of proportionality. Springs can be used to store energy. When we squash or stretch springs, work is done, and energy is transferred into the elastic potential energy store of the spring. The amount of work done, in joules, equals the elastic potential energy stored, also in joules. This is because energy is conserved, meaning it can't be created or destroyed, only transferred between different stores. This energy can then be transferred to other stores when the spring returns to its original length. For instance, if it was mechanically transferred and caused an object to move, this would be transferred to a kinetic store. So as long as we're talking about a spring which hasn't yet reached the limit of proportionality, or the elastic limit, then we can calculate the amount of elastic potential energy stored in that spring by using this formula here. Capital E always stands for energy, and the subscript P tells us we're talking about a type of potential energy, and here it's elastic potential energy. So elastic potential energy is half multiplied by something called K, which is the spring constant, and that will be different and particular for every single spring. And this is multiplied by the extension. So when we say extension, we don't just mean the length of the spring, we mean how much longer is it now compared to when there was no force acting on it. So we can calculate extension by doing the final length take away the initial length. If you're not super confident with algebra already, it's worth pointing out that that squared term only refers to the E, it only refers to extension. So when we're working out elastic potential energy, we're going to square the extension, we're not going to square everything that comes before it. If we were going to do that, we'd need to see brackets in this formula. You also need to know the units for each of these terms. So elastic potential energy is a type of energy and therefore it's measured in joules. The spring constant is in newtons per meter and extension should be measured in meters like all lengths in physics. And this can be a little bit confusing because often when we're doing experiments in the classroom, well, we're not gonna have a spring that is meters long. So you're almost always going to need to do a conversion to get your extension into meters. Let's practice a little bit of substitution here. So we want to calculate the energy that is stored when a spring with a spring constant of 120 newtons per meter extends by 0.4 meters. And apart from the fact that this entire video is about elastic potential energy, I know that this is a question about elastic potential energy because we're talking about springs being extended. So therefore I know which equation it is that I need to use. So I need to do half multiplied by k multiplied by e squared. And if you don't have a calculator that can do fractions and do halves, it's fine. You just use 0.5 instead. So 0.5 or half multiplied by 120 multiplied by 0.4 squared. And what I would recommend is that you actually work out what 0.4 squared is before you start. So 0.4 squared is 0.16 and I can add that in. And if I multiply all those together, I get the answer 9.6. Now, elastic potential energy is a type of energy store, and therefore it needs to be in joules. And we want to make sure, if you're just going to write the shorthand and just write the single letter, it wants to be a nice capital J so that your examiner knows for certain you mean joules and not something different. 
If we take another example of a similar question, here we've got a spring constant of 1900 newtons per meter and an extension of eight centimeters. But of course, it's really important that our extension is always in meters, otherwise we won't get the right answer to the calculation. So you convert from centimeters to meters by dividing by 100. So eight centimeters is 0 0.08 meters. Then we can put this into the same equation we were using before. And then, as I said, I would work out what 0 0.08 squared is rather than trying to include this in the calculation. So half times 1900 times 0 0.0064 will give me an answer of 6.08. And then because this is a type of energy, it's measured in joules. One thing we haven't really talked about so far in this energy topic is significant figures. Generally speaking, if the exam board want to award marks for assessing whether you understand significant figures or not, then they will specify in the question how many to give your answer to, as we have here. But the general rule of thumb is that you can't be more precise in your answer than the data you're working from. And that means you should use the same number of significant figures in your answer as the quantities in the question. And if there's a difference there, say one is to two significant figures and one is to three, you go with the smaller number. So here, we're given data to two significant figures, and we're asked to give our answer to two significant figures in the question. Remember, rounding should be the very last thing that you do. So we're going to use the same formula we've already been using. Half multiplied by the spring constant multiplied by the extension squared. And of course, we've converted that extension from centimetres into metres. And that gives an answer of 37.485 joules. But that isn't two significant figures, that's to five. So I'm now going to need to round this. And because the answer is less than 37.5, I round down, giving me an answer of approximately 37 joules. So now here are five questions for you to have a go at. Remember, in each instance, we need to make that extension into metres. And I would thoroughly advise that you square it separately before you complete the calculation. Also, you need to make sure that each one of your answers is given to two significant figures. So pause the video and write down some answers now. So we start by converting. 30 centimetres is 0 0.3 metres and 0 0.3 squared is 0 0.09. So I can plug that into my calculation. Half multiplied by 150 multiplied by 0 0.09 gives me an answer of 6.75 and then to two sig figs, that's 6.8. Same thing for question two. 45 centimetres is 0 0.45 metres. 0 0.45 squared is 0 0.2025 Half times 25 times 0 0.2025 gives me 2.53125 joules. And then if I round that to two sig figs, I get 2.5 joules. Then for my next questions, I actually get quite nice answers. So 24 joules is already to two sig figs and 900 joules is already to one sig fig. Um, and then for my final one, I get 9,687.5 joules, which rounds to 9,700 joules. As we said in the videos for work done and for power and for gravitational potential energy, you do need to be able to rearrange each one of these equations to make any one of the terms the subject. And now this starts to get a little bit more tricky because with elastic potential energy, we're not just multiplying a bunch of numbers together. There's some more complicated terms in there. So let's say that we want to make spring constant the subject of this equation. Well, right now it's multiplied by a half and it's multiplied by this e squared. So to begin with, we're going to get rid of the half by multiplying everything by two. So that gives us two lots of energy is Ke squared. And then to get rid of the E squared, right now it's multiplying. So we want to do the inverse operation, which is dividing. Whatever we do to the right, we do to the left. So our E squared ends up as the denominator of a fraction over here. And so we now see that K, the spring constant, is found by doing two lots of the elastic potential energy divided by the extension squared. So if we want to calculate the spring constant when a spring stores 12 joules of energy as it extends by 0.2 metres, we say 2 lots of 12, which is 24, divided by 0.2 squared, which would be 0.04, and we get an answer of 600 newtons per metre. Here's one more example, and this time we've been asked to give our answer to two significant figures. So I've got a spring that stores 46.8 joules of energy, and it's deforming by 40 centimetres. So my first thing is to convert that into metres. 40 centimetres is 0.4 metres, and then I'm going to do my squaring before I do the calculation. So 0.4 squared is 0.16. Then I'm going to factor all of this in. So two lots of 46.8 divided by 0.16 gives me 585 newtons per metre, but I've been asked to give my answer to two significant figures. So that gives me 590 newtons per metre. 
Now it's your go, so pause the video and have a go at these five questions. For question one, our spring stores 236 joules and it's deforming by 50 centimetres. So 50 centimetres is 0.5 metres and 0.5 squared is 0.25. So 2 times 236 divided by 0.25 gives me 1,888 newtons per metre, but of course I need to round it to 1,900 newtons per metre. Then we have two lots of 182.7 divided by 0.09, which is 4,060, which rounds to 4,100. Then two lots of 96 divided by 0.16 gives me 1,200 newtons per metre, which I don't need to round because it's already to two significant figures. Then we've got two lots of 12.5 divided by 0.0625, which is 400 newtons per metre. Again, I don't need to round it. And then finally, two lots of 6.615 divided by 0.0036 gives me an answer of 3,675 newtons per metre, which is going to be 3,700 once I've rounded it to two sig figs. So finally, we're going to calculate extension, which I would argue is probably the most challenging thing you can do with this equation. So we start off exactly the same as we did when we were rearranging to make k the subject. We want to get rid of that half, so we double everything. So now we've got two lots of energy is ke squared. Now to get rid of the k, right now it's multiplying, which means I need to divide. And whatever I do to the right-hand side, I do to the left-hand side. So we end up with a fraction with two lots of energy on top and k underneath, and that's equal to e squared. Now I don't want e squared, I just want e. So to turn e squared into e, I square root it. And the important thing here is that that square root sign applies to everything on the left. So if I were doing this calculation, I would work out what two times the elastic potential energy is. I would divide that number by the um, spring constant k, and then I would take that number and put it back into my calculator with square root. I wouldn't try to make a fraction with square root applying to the whole fraction because something somewhere will probably go wrong. So let's say I now want to use this calculation to calculate the extension when a spring with a spring constant of 1500 newtons per meter is given 120 joules of energy. Two lots of 120 joules will be 240. I divide that by 1500 to get 0.16 and then I take the square root of 0.16 which is 0.4 meters. Now it's time to pause the video and have a go at these last four questions yourself. For question number one, we have 101.25 joules of elastic potential energy stored. So we need to double that and divide it by 1000, which gives us 0 0.2025, and the square root of that will be 0.45 metres. Then for question two, we're doubling 196 and dividing it by 800. And that gives us square root of 0.49 for the extension, which is 0.7 metres. Then for question three, we get an answer of 0.63 metres. And for question four, we get an answer of 1.2 metres. Hopefully you found that a useful refresher about all things to do with elastic potential energy. Don't forget that springs do also come up in the forces topic and we have a separate video for that as well. Thank you very much for watching and if you did find it useful, don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE physics videos coming soon.